after generation, year after year, the Corps renews its strength. From this lifeline of new and untried Marine recruits flows the Corps' future leadership. Like thousands of Marines before them, Many may later be called upon to lead men under the most demanding and challenging conditions, combat. But gaining skills to successfully lead men into combat does not just happen. top shape, ready for the physical demands of combat. Physical conditioning like this, along with the realistic training, prepares Marines to fight and win on the battlefield. Like every Marine that I landed with on the beaches of Kwajalein, Enuitok, Saipan during World War II, we were ready to fight before we shipped out to the Pacific. It's too late waiting for the combat and then learn your job. You have to talk to other combat veterans. You have to read on past wars or Korea, Iwo Jima, look at films, uh, lessons learned in Vietnam, some of the problems that we've had. It's your responsibility to maintain that knowledge, not wait until you get in a combat situation and then learn from there. When did you get into combat, it's too late to learn and you have to hit the ground running. And uh, that's, I think we learned that ahead of time. A combat leader is also a good leader in peacetime. If he can't lead in peacetime, he will never make it in combat. Everything a Marine does in peacetime prepares him emotionally and physically to be victorious on the battlefield. Beginning with the raw materials of strong character and worthy values, leadership skills are carefully molded by the expert hands of drill instructors and unit leaders. Hammered into fighting shape in the forge of intense training, hardened by the fires of marine tradition, galvanized by self-discipline, pride, and patriotism. These Marines are gaining skills in small unit tactics and leadership. They are fortunate to be learning such skills from a combat veteran who saw them work in Vietnam. The combat wisdom that is hard for him to pass on, however, is what war itself is really like. It takes the actual living and the intense and awesome reality of war to appreciate the thoughts, the hopes, the fears, that run riot in the minds of men in combat. And eliminate them with the maximum firepower that's available to you. It begins with the waiting. Waiting to go in. Waiting to take off. To move out. To move up. 
waiting to go into what one Marine combat veteran calls the savage, brutal, exhausting, and dirty business of war. E.B. Sledge, nicknamed the Sledgehammer, saw and felt combat at its most intimate level, that of the grunt. Sledge remembers his first campaign, voicing the thoughts, the feelings of every Marine before his first attack. Would I ever see my family again? Would I do my duty or be a coward? Could I kill? I never experienced any more agonizing suspense than the excruciating torture of those moments before we received the signal to begin the assault. I broke out in a cold sweat as the tension mounted with intensity of the bombardment. My stomach was tied in knots. I had a lump in my throat, swallowed with great difficulty. I felt nauseated and feared that my bladder would empty itself and reveal me to be the coward I was. Fear, a reality of war. Fear of the always present danger of being killed or wounded, anticipation of the unexpected, apprehension that one may not measure up as a Marine under fire or letting a brother Marine down. Fear grips all men going into combat to some degree or another. But fear does not mean the lack of courage. Courage means overcoming fear and doing one's duty in the presence of danger, not being unafraid. Yeah, I can remember the first time I was in a, in a combat, first firefight. I think at first of all, you're absolutely right. Everybody is scared. Uh, and you really don't know what to do. But then you start realizing what's happening around you. And you know you're in charge. You better say something. You're going to get everybody wiped out. You take charge and you say, all right, let's move out. And you get up and you move out with them. Uh, they're going to see this. They gave us the word that we were uh, going to Grenada, and everybody was excited, scared, confused. And uh, we had one gunny, that uh, Gunny Ash, who was a Vietnam vet, and everybody kind of looked up to him for advice. We knew what we were going to do, what we were facing, but we weren't sure of how to handle the fear of combat. But once we had landed onto the island, Things fell into place. The fear was controlled. It didn't go away, but it was controlled. And, and the training that we had had prior paid off. We felt confident and comfortable with what we were doing. We knew what we were doing. We were ready for any kind of mission that was, we were going to face. Confidence in their previous training, their leadership, their fellow Marines, and themselves is enough to overcome most fears. When the orders came, Robert, Bailey, Sledge, and the Marines around them moved as every Marine is trained and committed to, against the enemy. To those of us who entered the meat grinder itself, it was another world of fear and horror where the fighting dragged on and on, and escape seemed less and less likely. Every muscle in my body was as tight as a piano wall. I learned a new sensation of utter, absolute helplessness. At times, it was though as I was alone out there on the battlefield, utterly forlorn in a tempest of violence. Often it seemed impossible that we could ever reach our objective, yet the thought never occurred to us that our attack might fail. For us, Combat was a series of changing events characterized by confusion, 
awesome violence, gripping fear, physical stress and fatigue, fierce hatred of the enemy, and overwhelming grief over the loss of friends. The end of a patrol, a battle, a campaign. You can see in the eyes of each survivor the price he's paid. Yet throughout the history of the Corps, Marine combat veterans have gone on to fight again, and for good reason. A man's ability to survive in combat depends on his comrades and his immediate leadership. Our discipline, esprit de corps, and tough training were all the ingredients that taught me to survive. Boot camp taught me I was expected to excel even under stress. Combat is a vindication of Marine training, proof that each Marine can use his weapon and equipment efficiently in combat, proof that he can trust and depend upon the Marines on each side of him and on his leadership. And we have something else going for us, patriotism, a deep love of this country and all it stands for. individual that's in the lead position has to have the right mental attitude. He has to believe in himself and he has to believe in the people around him. You believe so strongly in your people that if something were to happen to you, you feel that the whole thing will move on. What inspires Marines to excel like no other fighting man? That's the Spree de Corps, and it's the price you pay when you graduate from boot camp. You earn something, the title Marine, and that means something to everybody. There is something special about Marine Esprit de Corps that can be sensed right away. A British observer, while watching a Marine regiment move against a communist division, in a last-ditch effort to save the Pusan perimeter, our last toehold in Korea said, and I quote, they are faced with impossible odds, but I have a feeling that they will halt the enemy. I realize my expression of hope is unsound, but these Marines have a swag, snap, confidence, and hardness that is so apparent. Upon this line of reasoning, I cling to the hope of victory. The Spirit of Corps is built on commitment. More than anything else, men have fought and teams have won because of commitment. It's a commitment to a leader and to a small brotherhood, where the important things are Mutual respect, confidence, shared hardships, shared dangers, shared victories, discipline, and perseverance. Sam, Goldrick, come on up. Marines fight because of their perspective on how they fit into what I would call a family. And they know what the other members of that family will do because of their training and their involvement with these, their fellow Marines. And then it gets down to that point where he, the individual, is concerned that he does his share, that he does what his buddies expect him to do. And it's not letting those other Marines down. Marines fight for other Marines. They fight for the Marines in their unit, their, their buddies, the guy in the next foxhole, 
and they also fight for all those Marines that have gone before. The ultimate challenge to leadership in combat is to accomplish the mission while at the same time minimizing casualties, taking care of your men, being concerned for their welfare. comrades who struggled, bled, and died, and eventually won on Peleliu and Okinawa. E.B. Sledge wrote in his book, and I quote, We forged a bond that time would never erase. Marine Corps training taught us to kill efficiently and to try to survive. But it also taught us loyalty to each other and love. The legendary Chesty Puller loved by his men, not only because he accomplished the mission, but also because he took care of them. Colonel Lee was with Chesty in Nicaragua in 1934. The general called Lee the Iron Man because of his extreme bravery in combat. It took somewhere around about two months for them to get acquainted with him. And from there on, they uh, followed him just exactly the same as a bird dog would follow a gunner in the field. He took care of his men. Some leaders lead by fear. I think a more effective leader leads by example. He shows care and concern for his Marines. He respects them and they in turn respect him. They will follow him in combat knowing that he'll not waste them. Don't ask anything of your troops that you could not do yourself. If you told them to move out, you better move out with them. You better lead the way. When I think of Peleliu, I think of K Company, 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines. K Company was the left flank company in a two regiment landing on the island of Peleliu. About 150 yards to the left of where they were to land was a point which jutted about 25 yards out into the water and had a commanding view of the entire division beach. K Company's job was to take that point. And if they didn't, the whole division landing could be swept by Japanese fire. The point was fortified, heavily fortified, and air and naval gunfire didn't do the job. The company landed, wheeled to its left, and assaulted the point. And they took it. They took it, and they held it, even though they were surrounded. And at the end of 48 hours, the company that landed with 235 men had 78 left. The question is, what makes a unit fight like that? Well, this unit was very well trained. They actually rehearsed what they were going to do four times until every man knew exactly what was expected of them. They had good discipline. And they were governed by a, a driving spirit of unshakable loyalty on the part of each Marine to his fellow Marines. Today's generation of young Marines operating state-of-the-art equipment. Do the concepts of discipline unit identity, tradition, esprit de corps, teamwork, mission accomplishment have a different meaning to these Marines than they did to us 40 years ago? Is a different approach to leadership needed to inspire these conditions? 
Well, I would say uh, leadership in the Marine Corps has been the same since 1775, what we're after. Leadership is the ability to take people and mold them into a winning unit in combat, to be able to get the best, to make them excel, and at the same time take care of them and bring them back. When I went through the boot camp and uh, basic school back in the early Vietnam War years, the word then was uh, who, what, where, when, and only so much of why as was absolutely necessary. Over the years and culminating in Grenada, uh, I've come to realize that why might be the most important part of all. I don't mean why and the political why of why are we in Grenada, Colonel, but the tactical why. Why do you want me to do what you just told me to do? If you explain to the young Marine why you want something done, he realizes, one, that you trust him, that you're taking him into your confidence, and he knows how you're thinking. As a result, you'll get a hell of a lot more out of him. The Marine of 1918 was a different type of person than we have today. Today, we have a man that is educated. He's more technically inclined. He's schooled with his uh, sophisticated weapons. And he is better informed. They travel today in equipment that we dreamed about, and some of it that we weren't able to even visualize in the early days. Our Corps today is equipped and trained in such a way that I believe it is second to none. In the three wars that I've served in, there have been a lot of differences. Uh, we fought against different people. We fought in different countries. We fought with different weapons. But one of the things that I believe has been constant in all three of those wars is the basic foundation of effective combat leadership. Marines over there are all NCOs, going through a leadership course. They've been taught leadership traits and principles throughout their training. The same ones taught to my leaders in World War II. The same ones taught to leaders during Vietnam, the Korean War, and long before. Those leadership principles and traits have withstood the test of time and the foremost test, the battlefield. I'd say there are three key elements in leadership today. First is proficiency, that's technical knowledge in your rank in MOS, knowing your stuff. Second is integrity, that is uh, being a man of your word. Uh, and third is that you've uh, got to care. A leader is a man that can get other men to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. The leadership is, uh, is taught to you by uh, senior officers that uh, have the leadership and have shown the leadership in the past and uh, have been successful with leadership. And they know the basic things that it takes to, uh, to drive a platoon or to drive a man to, uh, to complete a, a job or a mission. It's fascinating and instructive talking to any Marine who has served in combat. It doesn't matter that they may have fought a different war or with different equipment. I always find many of their situations similar to my own combat experiences. And I keep reinforcing over and over again the knowledge that basics don't change. The principles of leadership and teamwork never change. Neither does the strong commitment that one Marine feels toward another. There's a sort of brotherhood that begins with boot camp and proves itself in combat. 
If someone were to ask me to draw the profile of an effective small unit combat leader, I'd do it this way. I'd say it's someone who really knows his stuff. I'd say it's someone who understands the vital importance of discipline. It's someone who understands the vital importance of hard, demanding training. It's someone who takes care of his men, got a sincere interest in their welfare. It's also someone who's physically fit and who leads by example. And finally, it's someone who's proud he's a Marine. I think that profile has been good for as long as there's been a Marine Corps. Throughout our long, proud history, combat veterans have taught untried Marines how to fight, to lead, and win on the battlefield. As these veterans leave the Corps, they take their combat experience with them. But to those who would study and learn from those experiences, the wisdom of combat will not be lost. In these Marines stands the Corps' future combat leadership. Before reaching this day, this place of honor, they were no different than any other young American men. But they have been hammered into form in a different forge, hardened by a different fire earning the right to muster with the elite, the few, the proud. If called upon, there is no doubt that they will fight with incredible bravery and win on any battlefield in the same tradition of those combat Marines who have gone before them. Once they're indoctrinated with the Esprit de Corps, it is like a branding Iron. A man is marked for life mentally and physically. And regardless of where he goes, a spree de corps follows him. And it is a band of brothers that can only be broken up by that last journey. 